Hello, folks. Just a quick one to let you know that we had some technical difficulties on the audio for this episode. You should still be able to hear and understand everyone, but we thought we'd give you a heads up just in case. Have fun and catch you soon. And some of them will be like, oh, that's a short story or oh, that's a novel or oh, that's a poem. I should never show that to anyone. <laughs> <laughs> Rusty Quill presents Enthusiasm. Hello, friends and fans, and welcome to Enthusiasm, the show where we talk about a few of our favourite things. I'm your host, Helen Gould, one of the best Rusty Quillers, and today we're talking about writing. And I am extremely happy and glad and honoured to be joined by Imogen, Lex, Nora and Rhys. As always, we are going to go alphabetically. So um, Imogen, can you give us your pronouns and tell us what you do? Hi there, I'm Imogen Harris, uh, pronoun she, her. I've been a voice on um, Rusty Quill for a couple of years now. I'm also a part-time ghostwriter, writer for hire and uh yeah, so uh, I also administrate data for a large bureaucratic institution. <laughs> I remember the last time you said that, you then said that you're a spy. So uh, we'll. I'm not a spy. <laughs> we'll scoot quickly over that. <laughs> My spy master had such a go at me. <laughs> <laughs> Next up, Lex. Who are you and what are your pronouns? Hi, I'm Lex. Uh, he, him. I'm a writer. I made uh, the Decca Tapes podcast, which got me involved with uh, Rusty Quill which also incidentally got me a book deal two years ago. So uh, currently working on uh, my first novel. Well, actually, it'll be it'll be a book and a podcast that kind of tie in uh, together. So in full writing mode at the moment. Oh, lovely. And Nora, what are your pronouns and what do you do? Hi, uh, I'm Nora Uncle and my pronouns are she, her. And I uh, got involved with Rusty Quill through... Uh, podcast that I produce called Cryptids. And additionally, I work primarily as a screenwriter and in the horror genre of filmmaking. So currently just digging deep into a couple of new horror thriller scripts. We love a horror. And last but absolutely not least, Reese, can you give us your pronouns and tell us what you do? I'm Reese. I am the tech assistant for Rusty Quill. I listened to the Magnus archives and said, you know what, I want to work here now. And that's just kind of <laughs> how it happened. Um, on the sidelines, I am the writer for the Nemesign podcast. And uh, I do a fair bit of other writing. I have a book coming out next year uh, called Burn Down, Rise Up. And it is a horror uh, novel for the young, the young adults. <sighs> I'm so I'm so happy. I'm so psyched to be here and talking about writing. Right. I mean, we're going to start with a question that all interviews about writing start with, which is when did we all start writing? And potential follow up. Do you remember the first thing you ever wrote? Because I think for me, it was a weird retelling mashup of like Beowulf and the Hobbit. They gave us like, <laughs> as a project at school, they gave us the first paragraph of The Hobbit and we had to finish it. And I remember drawing a Viking for some reason in association <laughs> with that. So I've been writing since I was a kid. Does anyone else want to uh, tell us their origin story? I think we have very similar inspiration because I think the first like time I seriously thought like no I'm gonna I'm gonna write a book <laughs> I was probably about seven or eight and it was quite it was like it, it wasn't just a book it was like an epic series of fantasy novels in my head um, in this sort of I think very much inspired by The Hobbit and also uh, like my brother's D and D figures and I didn't get very far with it but you know in my head it was it was palatial and there was a horse and time was going to start and stop. And yeah, um, wow. maybe, you know, maybe I should I should finish that at some point. Um, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did you say there was a horse? Okay, there was a horse that controlled time. The horse controlled oh, time. I see. Sorry, I didn't make that clear. <laughs> I think it was because a also, oh, no, it was also because I've been to the Natural History Museum and there's a like early kind of horse and it's known as Dawn Horse. Ooh. So like in my brain, this was like the horse was like the horse that makes time. And so if you cut the horse, you control time. 
and some people at some point have got like hold of it and keeping it underground or chained up and you have to go and save it because time's not working properly it sounds way better now like yeah that's I'm not like, bad at all Imogen <laughs> I would watch a movie about that yeah absolutely yes this sounds amazing Magical sounds like you have your wars. next project yeah <laughs> Gosh, does anyone want to follow that? I, just, I don't think I've written anything as good since, to be honest. <laughs> I don't think I was saying, I peaked. Like, it's best because idea you never finished that one. It'll come after. <laughs> First, you have to finish this one. All right, who's next? I actually recently discovered this notebook that I had filled um, when I was in like fourth grade. You know, so I was probably like eight or so. And we had just read this wonderful book, Island of the Blue Dolphins. Mm-hmm. Um, and I got super fascinated by this kind of island, uh, indigenous culture. And so I decided to write this almost Romeo and Juliet epic love story, uh, that didn't quite work out between two neighboring, um, tribes, I believe on two different islands and, uh, and then killed one of the main characters in the end. Cause I just like to be sadistic, um, <laughs> but found that and it's, it's true, true trash, but it was really enjoyable to find this horrible scrawled handwriting trying to, I guess, write a short story as a fourth grader. <laughs> <laughs> well, whomst among us has not killed off our main character. Yes. <laughs> well, Lex, how about you? Yeah, it kind of the same. I started off like uh, really young, like, like drawing little, comics before I could properly write, which was basically uh, Batman ripoffs, <laughs> and then starting uh, starting my first novel series. And I I also found them a while back. And I made, I started with making a kind of contents page, which summed up that there were five books. So <laughs> so I started with huge ambitions before, before writing them. And it was called Michael <laughs> the Detective, and it was basically James Bond. <laughs> I think that all books should be named like that. Yes. It was, it was very matter of fact. So the first chapter was, was called The Beginning, which could be philosophical, but it, 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 was, it for sure wasn't. <laughs> and Reese, what about you? Uh, definitely like super, super young. I think the first thing I ever like started with, it was, it was a very crude comic book about a spy. I don't even remember any dialogue. I think it was just watching this spy do her thing. And I don't, I do not recall what her thing was. It was just, her thing was being a spy. The first thing I ever wrote with dialogue was, um, I guess it was like a, a form of escapism from like middle school troubles. Just, you know, you know, when you get, you when you get into your really angsty phase and you're just kind of like, ugh. No one understands me. And I like I kind of coped with it by like writing a very bad Harry Potter spin-off, but like about my hometown. And I'm proud to say that I do not know where that writing has ended up because <laughs> if I rewrite it today, I would be picking myself apart. Right. I'm looking at the questions I've got and I wanna talk about I wanna ask all of these questions actually. Do it. We'll go with another classic one, which is who or what inspires you in your writing? I'd be really interested to hear this from people. Um, I don't know if anyone still like believes in a muse or anything, or if that is just an artistic painter kind of thing. I definitely believe in like muses in that, like uh, Stephen King talks about it, like basically it's you're not really your ideal reader, but like who you're writing for, that this writing is f for somebody. So it's more like the person that you really want to read it. Like, I think that it's that sort of thing that like mm. you have your ideal reader, um, the person you're talking to. Ooh, that's a whole other question. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, 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 that's great. I'm writing it down. <laughs> ideal reader. So in that case, the person inspiring you is an imagined figure. Yeah, that you're sort of doing it, I guess, to impress. I definitely have like an imagined figure that I'm trying desperately to impress with mm. my writing. I, that, that's a bit relatable, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is anyone else inspired by anyone or anything in particular? To me, there's like two ways to look at it. And one of them is just like you said, Imogen. And the other is more, uh, you know, the... The David Lynch philosophy of staying as true as possible to the initial idea, right? Well, 
Mm. He's not the first to think to think of that, of course, but he articulates it so well. Um, so that really inspires me that there's this there's this moment where your subconscious goes, "This is awesome," uh, and then it's your job to kind of like pull that thread and follow it wherever it goes. Um, and I used to think of inspiration as this like third thing. So there's you and there's the idea and then there's ins- inspiration and you hope that the, the inspiration motor keeps churning so you can follow the idea. But to me, if I like completely take that away from the equation and just look at the idea as the inspiration in itself, it prevents me from getting writer's block because uh, I just I just delete like all outside um uh, concerns and i just follow the idea and whatever feels right or befitting that idea yeah i just do that so act three of the book starts with a way too long scene uh, way too long of a scene right now but i don't care because if i if i worry about it i'll stress but this is just what the idea needs right now so yeah so what i'm trying to say is to me the inspiration should be in the in the idea for the story itself does this make any sense? Or yeah, 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 yeah. it does. Okay, I can okay. see Nora nodding. Yeah, no, I'm just you're you're speaking the words of my heart. That's exactly. I, I think I enter into everything with a particular atmosphere, a particular mood, something that it might even be an emotion that whatever audience member that you're talking about, Imogen, I want to evoke in them. But sometimes it's also just a feeling I want to evoke in myself. Um, but yeah, fi- like meshing that inspiration and that. Uh, the idea into one and for me through an emotion, through an atmosphere, that really helps. And so I often use this inspiration, obviously, as a filmmaker, images and music are a big element for me. So I I will often, if I have that barely seed of an idea, you know, just something that's even just a single image or a single character or a single plot point, um, the way that I kind of pull that thread and figure out what I'm actually trying to write and eventually, you know, actually write it is I often put together a whole pile of images that allow me to continue expanding that. And I will also like make a playlist so that whenever I turn on that playlist or whenever I look at that group of images, I'm immediately in that world. I'm immediately back onto the page. So yeah, no, I'm just listening to lots of like that's exactly I do the same thing I make a playlist (laughs) for each character it's really funny oh cool yeah yeah that's amazing yeah and it's because uh well for for podcasting it's different because you can put or I compose actual music but for like writing a novel for example I have a playlist for like different places and different characters so that way it's easier to get back in the uh like tone and rhythm of the place so I completely get the whole mood uh, uh thing yeah that's cool. super cool. Reese, what about you? What inspires you in your writing? I am just now realizing that I did not give my pronouns. It's they, them pronouns for everyone listening. Oh, the thing that inspires me is, um, I guess, like the media that I already consume. Because I go into every writing project with a sort of a question. So, like, for example, the the, the book that I, you know, is coming out next year I came into that writing piece thinking, what if Stranger Things happened in the Bronx? Mm. Like, what if that was like the like, it's just a simple question. And obviously, I had to have watched Stranger Things to come to that question. Um, But that's that's kind of how I enter. So it's like, I'm inspired by a lot of the things that I watch and I read. And then I kind of like take elements of it or like ask a simple question and then try to craft a story all around it. That's so cool. Do you make playlists? I do not mostly because I don't. I don't listen to music all that much. It's very hard to get me to, like, if you tell me, like, oh, you would love this artist, it will take me three more years to listen to that artist. And then oh, I will, and then I'll message you, like, you were right about this. And you're just like, what the hell are you talking? Like, that's, <laughs> that's the type of person I am. It takes me, ex- like, such a long time to get into new music. So it's, mm-hmm. I don't really do playlists all that much. I'm interested. Do you do, do you make playlists for your writing, Imogen? No, I don't. I'd never considered that. Um, generally, I guess... When I'm writing, I don't like to have anything that would distract me emotionally. So this is going to sound really awful. Mm. But like I listen to a lot of opera and things that are not necessarily wordless. But like if it was music, I don't know, I I feel like that would distract me. But I really, really like the idea of making a playlist for a character to like help you think about like what they're like and what they would be into and what their past is. And then because it forces you to think, oh, what were they into when they were a kid? Like, you know what's their kind of thing and yeah i think it's a really good idea but i could see how you how you wouldn't 
how you would want silence because I've definitely um, had too melodramatic music on and wrote horrible scenes because of it. <laughs> <laughs> So it's a, it's a powerful weapon. It's really dangerous if you if you use it the wrong way because music is so strong, right? It could it could definitely pull you in the wrong direction. Yeah, I've I've made playlists because um, I'm I'm <laughs> theoretically writing a book, <laughs> but I'm so busy. I never get time to work on it. I'm hoping I'll get back on the horse next month in in my editing pass but i have a playlist for that absolutely i want to come back briefly to what we mentioned about the ideal reader because i think that was that's a really interesting thing to to look at as in like who do we imagine our audience to be and um what is that relationship i mean i think there is a danger in like constructing it too much because I had mm. to rewrite I finished a manuscript and you know was sending it around and the thing I got back a lot was oh this is this is YA this is YA and I was like mm. if you say so like that seems yes I guess no problem with that and they're like oh no you know you need to you need to write it younger for a younger audience so mm. which I guess I you know you don't want to be too precious and be like my book is for everybody everybody can enjoy this because you know I've worked in publishing and I understand like I understand all this kind of stuff and why you have genre and why you have these classifications but then going back and writing it specifically for that I guess because it wasn't for an individual it was for my sort of nebulous idea of a market as well and that was definitely unhelpful because I'm like well well which I should have gone which 15 year old in particular and like had an idea <laughs> in my mind but rather than be I was like oh okay well it's it's you know it's it's for the youth then I suppose and that wasn't a very helpful kind of way to approach it um so yeah I think that I yeah I think I did a lot of uh I don't think it was productive to write mm. in that way this would completely stress me out like if I had to think right now about <laughs> what the demographic is, mm. I, I would completely, I, I, I wouldn't be able to, to finish the story, I think. Mm. Uh, I don't know, unless the initial idea is for, for like a blatantly obvious uh, young adult audience, for example, that's for my publisher. Like I would completely, I, I wouldn't know where to go if, if I had to, mm. to look at the other side of, uh, of the table, right, so to speak. Um, of course, you have to do everything you can to convey the story as good as possible to someone who doesn't have all the context you do. But apart from that, yeah. if I have to like imagine someone else, re I, pff, that that wouldn't work. Like I would completely, <laughs> <laughs> everything would stop, I think. What do you think, Nora? Well, in, in film, there's an exercise that we do where we have to basically create profiles for not mm. only your primary target audience, but your secondary and tertiary audiences. And mm. Yeah, for me, it's so draining and takes away from a lot of the writing. Like, I see the necessity of it. I do. And it does help to a degree. And kind of, I think primarily once you get it out of the writing phase and into, you know, how you're shooting it and how you're marketing it, it's really helpful to know to your audience. But yeah, for me, it's it's always different per project. And so thinking too hard about like, okay, so I have to give her a name, give her a place that she lives, like really imagine this very specific person. And I'll immediately start going like, oh, well, she's going to hate this. Like, you know, and I just get pulled out of it. And so, yeah, again, I, I always try to bring it back to, okay, whatever audience were to sit here and, and either in, engage in the art in whatever capacity, what's the emotion I'm trying to get them to feel? Mm -hmm. And and that is something when I'm trying to approach it from kind of like the overall human experience and the overall human takeaways and emotions that you can get from art. I try to see it, I guess, in that more well-rounded way. It's not as helpful. And I'm told that by producers and people who actually have to, you know, market the material and get it out there. But in terms of the initial creation process, yeah, it's, it's more helpful for me to think of like, how am I going to emotionally manipulate you right now instead? <laughs> What do you reckon, Reese? Are you writing for anyone in particular or? Ah, uh, no, <laughs> I don't write for anyone in particular. Um, I guess I write for myself mm. only in the sense that like, 
let's say if I have like, you know, this amazing story, if I don't write it, it's going to torture me for like, yes. you know, a while. Yes. So it's just like, you know, I'm not writing a story to be like, oh, I want like all the little girls out there to like, I'm just like, listen, 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 listen. I don't care. <laughs> on, <laughs> on, some, on some level, I do care. On some level. I mean, I'm not, I'm, that, it would be a total lie to say, oh, I don't care if you d- do or don't like it. Um, what's important to me is if I like it, if I'm excited yeah. about the book, if I love the characters, then it's just like, you know what? Someone out there will like it. I don't know who they are. I don't know what demographic they're going to be from, but I like it. They probably will too. And if they don't, it's whatever. I had fun writing this. And also it will not torture me at night when I'm trying to sleep. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think that's important. I think probably primarily every writer writes for themselves first. Like I, I'm, I'm writing... I write what I write because I write what I would want to read. And I feel like if I want to read something like this, I figure other people want to read it as well. It's interesting because you do, when you say, uh, I, I don't care about the reaction, my, my first initial thought is, yeah, I agree. But then I think, why, why translate it to an audience, right? So apparently there is a need. Like I, compl- I completely read, uh, write for myself. So I completely agree um, with that point. But on the other hand, I do want to be able to do it for a living, right? So, so apparently, I do care about the reception. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah. So there's like an interesting tension there that you do it for yourself, but n- not all the way, right? You, you need you need the other side to <laughs> to help you to be able to do it. It's really weird. Mm. Uh, yeah, you don't want to think about it, but you you are thinking about it. Yeah, because if it was just 100% for yourself, you'd just like, you'd finish it, put it in a drawer and go, well, that was a success. Like, yes. you wouldn't <laughs> yes. then try and like, oh, get mm. it published or anything. It's more like, mm, okay, so like, if I'm like looking to get something published, first, like, I'm still writing something that I enjoy first. Like, that's just mm-hmm. it. Because I, I can't write something that I don't like. And that's like, that's even throughout my writing process. If I feel like a scene is not getting me excited and I'm just like, if this is boring for me to write, it's going to be boring for people to read. Yeah, so I just like yeah. scrap it and like try to find something else to fill it. Um, but like, I guess I, I care more about the audience when I'm in like the revision process, not so much in the writing process. So oh, the revision is when mm-hmm. I can think about like, OK, does this scene make sense in the context of like the you know overall arching plot? Uh, you know, does this paragraph grab you the way that I'm trying to grab you? Like, I I care more about it in, like, after it's all said and done. But if I'm just, like, trying to get it on the page first, I don't have space in my heart to care about what people (laughs) think. That that can wait till, like, after it's written. It's it's almost like the revision process for me is is a translation process. You know, like, the Mm. first... The first version is just like, okay, vomit this thing out. Just get the story out there in a way that's not just like a swirling pool in your head. And then revision is like, okay, now how do I tell this in a way that other people can interpret it the way that I interpret it? And and how do I have my characters speak that says and does all the things that I've initially thought of, but in a way that other people can actually understand? I'll tell you something, um, a problem that I come across in my own writing is that I have a really vivid imagination right and um that extends into everything I have a very visual mind I have extremely vivid dreams I often lucid dream and uh what that means for my writing is that I often because everything is so clear to me in my mind's eye I forget to describe it Mm. for the reader does anyone else have that problem? Yeah. I know what you mean, yeah, yeah, especially with a character when you see them so vividly and they're so clear to you and you just, you don't really ever feel you need to describe them because it's like, well, I know yeah, exactly so- what they look and sound and speak <laughs> and move like. Yeah. How can you not know what they look like? But sometimes those instincts are right, I think, because you don't always need a character description and maybe the parts mm. where you fill in the blanks it's is the part where it's nice as a reader to also subconsciously fill in the blanks, right? Yes. So it could also help you develop your style to just completely lean into uh, that, right? Yes. I actually, yeah. I came across a writer who does that. The writer who did the, uh, what was it? The Miniaturist, um, Jesse something i think but she barely describes anyone at all (laughs) and i like that i really struggle with when to go into detail uh with uh like just the way someone looks right Mm. uh because it could totally like it could totally uh, break the momentum in the scene sometimes um yeah 
I find that really hard. Like when to when to really tell you what someone looks like. It doesn't matter most of the time to me, but maybe that's just no. Uh, no. I tend to put like just like little traces here and there. Yeah. Like um, when it's relevant to what's happening in the scene. So it will be like, I don't know, um, if they're getting ready to go out and they're looking at themselves in the mirror, I might say something about what they're wearing or something that they're dissatisfied about with their preference, with their appearance or something that they like about their appearance or something. Because, you know, we, we all do that when we're about to go out and you sort of stand in front in your little outfit and you're like, hmm, I could do this <laughs> <laughs> or that. Yeah. Yeah, so then it, then it really makes sense in in the scene and in the motivation to describe uh, to describe it. I can't stand huge paragraphs of just just pure description of a thing if it doesn't actually have a point. Um, Nora, I'm interested since you're largely a, a film writer, and we're talking about visualization. Like, how does that work for you? Yeah, I mean, I've been recently toying with my own, and I emphasize toying with my own writing of a novel <laughs> and I found who the skill sets are completely different. Um, just the very act mm -hmm. of screenwriting is in present tense and there's no particular narrator uh, unless obviously you put a narrator in. And it's also the rule of thumb is you can't write anything that you can't see or hear. So any sort of internal monologue, any sort of thing that you want to kind of slide in there through the character's experience you, you can only show, yeah. basically, and you have to find really subtle ways of being able to do all the exposition without, you know, uh, actually doing exposition. Mm. And so, it, and we're in, with the novel, I've, I've found, granted, I'm not good at it, but it, it's, it, there's a lot more freedom to be able to kind of say what you want to say when you want to say it, mm. um, to a degree. And so, yeah, with the visualization, there's almost this minimalist quality to a screenplay where you're really just telling you the bare minimum of what you need to know, the bare minimum of the movements, the bare minimum of the uh, description. Like you rarely, unless it's uh, plot driven, you rarely even describe what people are wearing unless it's something that, you know, really like you need to know this woman's in a yellow dress because you see the woman in the yellow dress later on or the yellow dress becomes a plot point. Yeah whatever it be. But otherwise, yeah, you don't really even do those descriptions. It's a lot more about like what, how they stand and how they walk and what they're looking at, like to be able to describe a character and lots of, you know, words like surly and stuff like that. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, but what, yeah, what I like to do with screenplays is really kind of set that scene and, and set the mood and the tone so that your mind can be really, creating the scenes as you go and I think a good screenplay is really something that just lets your imagination run wild and play the movie in your head um because that's you know when you get bogged down by too many details uh, you're trying to read at the pace of you know basically a minute per page right yeah. so it's like you're trying to read at the pace of you'd be watching the movie so if you have too many details or you have scenes that run on for longer than you know three minutes three pages it's you're kind of dead in the water. So yeah, for me, it's really about, okay, what's the bare minimum I can tell you to make you imagine, you know, an entire middle earth. <laughs> I think a lot about a, uh, like a screen direction from NBC Hannibal, um, where one of the characters, Jack walks into a room and it says something like, he's offended at being here. <laughs> <laughs> and then you oh, look at the great. scene and you look at Jack's face and you're like, yeah, he hates this. <laughs> <laughs> Reese, how do you feel about visualization and um, imagination when it comes to translating things to the page? I struggle a lot with visualization, um, mostly because sometimes I don't know what things are called, especially if it's in, in a very unique setting. So mm. like if let's say this thing is like if, if I have like the scene that absolutely has to take place at like, you know, some uh, like a generic film location. I don't know any of the generic filming names. I don't know what like a mic <laughs> boom is. Obviously I know it now because I had to look it up at one point. But like anything else, like whatever lights they use, I don't know what it's called. So a lot of the times it's just like, I, I struggle a lot with it just because I'm just like, I don't know what these things are called. How am I supposed to describe it? Mm. And also I struggle with knowing what's important to show sometimes. So I don't need to, like, describe, you know, how many freckles a character has on their face unless uh, it's to show 
that the other character is so in love with them that like you know the freckles really matter like it's yeah. it's one of those things so it's like the only time i like really go into detail with like a person's appearance is if i'm trying to well it helps to you know the the, the reader to visualize but also it's to convey some sort of message to the to the reader yeah yeah, it's that thing about like the more detail you give about something, the more it indicates your protagonist is looking at it or cares about it. Uh, that's a really useful rule of thumb. I think we're going to take a break there while I ponder everything that everyone said. This is really interesting. We'll be back in a minute. And welcome back. The next question I want to ask is one that probably um, the audience is interested in, which is about advice. I'd be interested to know, because like we're all at varying stages of our careers. I'd like to know like something that you've learned along the way or advice you would give to other writers that may be at different stages in their careers. Because I think, because for me, like the most Im important piece of advice I would give is not to worry so much. <laughs> um, and I mean that in a sentimental, emotional way of like, it will be fine if you finish that like good and finished is far better than perfect and unfinished, but also in a practical way, which is if you worry too much about your writing, you get trapped in and you're probably going to get trapped in a cycle of editing and re-editing and re-editing. And, you know, a lot of books have a million different phases, but um, each of them have a point. But if you're doing it by yourself, you often end up editing just for the sake of it because you're mm. not sure of yourself and you've got to eventually just have the confidence to be like, this is done. Yeah, it's never perfect, you just stop. Yeah, you have to find the way to, um, a way to stop. On that, my, the best piece of advice I ever got is actually kind of like a, a, a trick in, in which to do what you were just saying, Helen, mm. which is the, the best lesson I learned was don't go back and read what you wrote yesterday. Um, you, you read maybe the last paragraph, maybe the last thing that you need to read in order to kind of get back into the rhythm, yes. back, get back into the flow. But the moment you start reading what you actually wrote, you start judging yourself. You start thinking about mm -hmm. it. You're, you're like, oh my God, this is so bad. Um, and because it is, it's a first draft. Usually the goal is to just finish it so that you, you can then edit and make it actually good. Yeah. But the best means for me, at least, to get through to the end of that is by not ever looking at what I wrote before, yeah. because I get so in my head once that happens. That is very yeah. good advice. <laughs> I'm going to, like, remember that. Yeah. <laughs> Locking that in yeah. there. <laughs> I dated someone once who was just caught in a cycle of rewriting his introductory chapter over and over and over again. <laughs> because obviously every time he opened the document... It was the first thing he looked oh, at no. and he would be like, no, this has to be perfect. That's like sort yep. of beautifully Chekhovian, isn't it? Like that kind yeah. of character. It's like he spent 10 years writing the opening chapter of his novel. Like, I love that. That's <laughs> awesome. You got you to gotta fight, fight through that first draft. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, you're going to be just the author version of like Sisyphus, just constantly <laughs> yeah. trying to write that. Truly. Do you have any advice, Imogen? Okay, so my advice is, right, this, okay, make yourself write 100 ideas. Because the, the, you can feel like, oh, I don't, you know, there's this temptation to think that ideas are like this kind of finite resource or that it's like inspiration that comes to you or like, you know, it, you've got this brilliant idea and it's not working out, but you have to keep hammering on it because it's a good idea and like you won't ever have a one as good and what if it's not good or what do you want to write about or all that kind of stuff. And ideas are an absolutely infinite resource and you can always have more of them. And the way to prove that to yourself is to make yourself write down 100 ideas. And you don't have to do it all in a one -er. Like I do it over several days in blocks of 10. They don't have to be good. They don't have to be original, but there does have to be a hundred of them. And mm -hmm. when you've done that, you can, you've A, proved to yourself that you can have as many ideas as you want. B, some of them are going to be good. Like you, I guarantee you will not have written a hundred really bad ideas. And they'll like, you'll be sort of free of them because you're like, okay, they're written down. I don't need to worry about forgetting them. And like, I can come back to this document and read through it. And some of them will be like, oh, that's a short story. Or, oh, that's a novel. Or, oh, that's a poem. I should never show that to anyone. And like, <laughs> <laughs> I find it quite kind of freeing just to remind myself that like, oh, you know, if you've had this, you've put your heart and soul into something and it hasn't worked out or it hasn't gone the way you want it to. And you're like, but that's, that was my idea. That was my good idea. It's like, no, mm. you, you can have another, you will have a hundred, like, 
should prove yourself. So yeah, that's my advice. I'm going to take that that's advice because uh, I write a short story every month for my Patreon and uh, that will probably be a very practical thing for me to do. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm sorry, Lex, I kept interrupting you before. What were you going to say? Two things really helped me. The first was... So everybody talks about writing rituals, right? And and like what desk a writer sat at and at what time he or she started, et cetera, et cetera. But then uh, this Dutch writer had this really interesting talk about, um, he said, it's really important to look at stuff like that as a kind of um, a deal with your subconscious. He's like, mm. you expect your subconscious to like do this monumental task of solving all these plot issues, giving you character, stuff like that. And he said, um, there's no way to really control it, but you can facilitate it by like making a deal with it, right? So um, uh, that's a whole, or for me at least, a whole different way to look at a writing ritual. And it really helped me, um, especially now, to just say, okay, this week, every day, between those and those hours, the only thing I'm going to do is solve this scene, right? And it really helps me, um, yeah, to, to help your subconscious help you, <laughs> help mm. help help you help yourself, uh, uh, kind of. And the and the second thing um, that really helps me when I get uh, an idea for a new story is to really critically um, ask yourself why you're writing it. Right. So I I know some people who kind of fall out of love with their art because they're like pursuing some kind of success and um, it doesn't really work out that way, and then. Uh, they don't pursue the art itself anymore. And that's really mm. tragic, I think. So um, it helps. Like, like there are some stories and I know this is just for me, right? There's no like practical outlet for it right now. And that's fine. And to just kind of remind yourself of that, that it's just for you and that's fine. Uh, uh, it helps uh, do different kind of project and keep the energy up. And, and it's really important to be amb- ambitious too, right? So if you have an idea and you're like, this is going to be my worldwide break into like that's good too but then you know uh, that the time and effort spent into uh, that project is very very different um yeah so so that's two things that really helped me uh, get stuff done for me i guess uh my advice would be so there's this very i can't remember who told me about this i feel i'm pretty sure it was someone from rusty quill like i i remember being like like talking to someone and they mentioned this was to me cannot remember cannot remember for the life of me who so um if if you're listening to this i'm sorry if i've forgotten you <laughs> the one thing that I've, i i swear by because it is helpful is um and then there was a gunshot so if you're finding that you're like, let's say you're trying to write a chapter or like a scene or whatever, and things are very, very slow. And you're just kind of like, why is this? Like, why does it feel like I'm trudging through mud? Mm. Um, You need to like, do something like something completely random or out of the ordinary, and then it'll pick back up again. And what it's called is, and then there was a gunshot. Like, what would happen if, like, and it's a fantasy story, and then there was a gunshot. Make it fit. I don't know. Um, But, like, it obviously doesn't have to be a gunshot. But, you know, figure out what's, like, the outrageous thing that can happen in your story. Make it happen. See see how the story picks up from there. I think I saw something like that written as, like, one of Pixar's rules, which was, if you're ever stuck, think of what absolutely would not happen in this scene and then write it. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and then even if that doesn't work you probably have like a slightly scaled back version of something interesting that would happen we have almost come to time so i want to round us off with one last quick fire question although now i'm looking at it i'm like oh actually this might take ages for people to think about um and that question is if you could meet any author or playwright or poet oh, wow. living or dead who would it be uh, I'll, I'll start since I know this off the top oh, of my go head, for it. but uh, Guillermo del Toro, I oh, would yes. die, oh, yeah. die and kill and die again to, <laughs> to be able to uh, meet just what a um, what a gem of a person and an artist. Yes. So, yes, please. <laughs> Pan's Labyrinth is one of my favorite films. Oh, Absolutely it's, favorite. I think it's kind of defined a lot of my own personal aesthetic. Just mm. I'm just going to steal from Pan Labyrinth as much as I can. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's just I used to watch it like every Thursday. <laughs> oh, I don't come in home school, from school I did like it. a like 60 page essay on like every shot, every wow. 
decision made, and I still loved it yeah. at the end of that. And I was like, okay, I guess that's really good. <laughs> <laughs> Reese, um, what? Who? Who would you like to meet then? Oh yeah, um, Octavia Butler. Um, oh, good choice. She, yeah, I finished reading. I'm. St- I, I remember reading um, Parable of the Sower mm. last year at the start of the pandemic, and that was a mistake. Oh. Because, <laughs> yeah, I like I read it, and I was just like, what did you know, Miss Butler? What did you know? <laughs> <laughs> like, she, she got too many things spot on, and I'm just kind of like, ma'am, excuse me? What? Like, you can't just be out here like, oh, I'm an oracle of, like, you know, the future times, and then, like, be dead at the same time. Like, I need to talk to you now. <laughs> Um, so yeah, like I, I wish she was still alive so I could talk to her. Cause God, that, mm. that book, I'm, I'm slowly making my way through the sequel Parable of the Talents, but I'm just kind of like absolutely floored mm. by a uh, Parable of the Silver right now. Wow. How about you, Lex or Imogen? Um, I was thinking about that. I had a bit of time to think. And I guess, uh, oh, his favorite writer is George Orwell. But then like, mm. if I met him, what would I do? I would shake him by the hand and say, you're the greatest writer of the 20th century, Mr. Orwell. And he would say, Yes. And then... <laughs> Did I come back from the dead for this? <laughs> yes. Like, is there anything else you want from me? Um, so, yeah, I guess thinking about it, I would go Roald Dahl because his adult short stories were a huge influence on me as a kid. I realised I read them when I was maybe a little too young hmm. and then reread them like as a early 30 year old and thought, that's what I've been trying to write like for the last 20 years. Mm. Ah, um, so, and I also think uh, he would take me to some incredibly, like, we'd go out to some bar in London and he'd buy me a double whiskey and tell me scandalous stories. And I think he'd be, <laughs> he'd be a good night out. And what about you, Lex? I read somewhere that uh, J.R. Tolkien um, had more story ideas than you could ever write in many lifetimes, he said. So please mm-hmm. tell me all of the story ideas. <laughs> 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 oh, gosh. Very good. And I have now been hoist by my own petard because I have no idea who I would want to, who I'd want to talk to. I think, I think I might like to talk to James Baldwin. Um, hmm. I think it would probably be a very depressing conversation because I'd be like, James, look, and he'd be like, yeah, it's still shit in it, but he'd, but he'd be a lot more, he'd be a lot more <laughs> eloquent than me. <laughs> um, but I would love, I would love to have met him absolutely and with that i think that's the end of the show i think we're calling it there um thanks so much i like writing is such a huge part of my life and yet i actually very rarely talk about it with anybody so this has been <laughs> great i hope you've all had a good time yeah super sure. good absolutely really <laughs> Yeah, learned a lot actually. Yeah, I hope we'll all take each other's advice. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And thank you, audience, for coming along with this. I hope that if you are also a writer, we have done something helpful for you as well. I will see you in the next episode. I'm not sure if any of these people will because I still do not know in what order these episodes are going to come out. (laughs) 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 But until then, it's goodbye from me. Goodbye. And it's goodbye from all of them. Do you want to say goodbye, everyone? Goodbye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Enthusiasm is a podcast distributed by Rusty Quill and licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Share Alike 4.0 International License. It is directed by Helen Gould produced by Lori Ann Davis with executive producers Alexander J. Newell and April Sumner and edited by Marissa Ewing, Tessa Vroom, Jeffrey Nils Gardner and Catherine Ranella. Thanks for listening. Mm-hmm.